I'm Tom Ray from the band Lorenzo's Music, and you're listening to the Lorenzo's Music Podcast. The guy that I talked to today, I actually wanted to meet for quite some time. He runs a band, he has a label, he records bands, he does all kinds of stuff. I'm Bobby Hussey, my band's The Hussey, I'm in Cave Curse, I'm in Fireheads, on and off in No Bunny. I record a lot of bands, put out records, put out tapes. So we got together at his house and we talk about how he runs a label, how he got started, about all the kind of stuff that he does. I already knew you had a lot of bands, but like No Bunnies, I never heard of that one. Is uh, yeah, that... it's a bigger band. I, Me and Heather were his backing band years ago, like five years ago we were his backing band, and we did uh, tours in America and Australia. We would always open, and then we would be his band behind him. Where are you from? I'm from uh, Plymouth, Wisconsin originally, so that's near Sheboygan. Okay. Yeah, it's about two hours northeast of here. Um, been in Madison since, oh my gosh, 2004. So I, I lived most of my adult life here. I went to college here. What did you go to college for? I have a journalism degree from UW-Madison. Do you really? I do. I think you're the second person I've met with a journalism degree from the UW. Somehow meet a lot of people with journalism degrees <laughs> around here, and they're not, all not doing anything to do with journalism. How did you get started? Like, What was your first instrument that you first started out with? When I was... 12 I played drums for a tiny bit and the drum set that I bought then was a hundred dollars and it literally is the drum set that sits at the practice space now and all the bands use it's a horrible piece of trash but um it's still I don't know people still use it but I was not very good at drums and my dad always had guitars he had a guitar since I I mean he's had he played in bands in the 70s but he always had a guitar laying around and then I was like 13 I was like picked up a guitar I was like it just like could play it really quickly I don't know it just like made way more sense to me and then why did you start out with drums because I just wanted to play drums I don't know you're a kid <laughs> you want to do something you're not good at it then right. yeah I don't know then I found a guitar I liked a guitar and then started a band when I was 15 what was the band it was uh called death by chickens uh. it was not my band name <laughs> uh that was the first band I ever played in, and then we formed a band called Bleached, which is actually crazy because now there is a band called that. Yeah, when I moved here, I don't know, I met Heather like within a year. I met her because uh, back in the day at UW Madison, um, they had these like uh, at the dining hall. They had like a little. It would be an ad for the shows at the Union. I went down the list. You know, it was like the second month I was in school. I went down the list and. All of, none of them said rock except one. And I was like, wow, well, I'll go to that one. Yeah. And I went to that one, and it was Heather's old band, Cats Not Dogs. Oh. And um, I was in that band, ultimately. Okay. But So I went to see them, and on that same night, my in my freshman college class, there was my this guy I met, he was a senior, and he was playing the same night. So Heather, Cats Not Dogs played at the Union. Sleeping in the Aviary played at, at the um, Catacombs. Okay. And like uh, I caught both, I went and caught both, became friends with both of them right after that. And then Heather, I like became really good friends with just like via MySpace. Like I emailed the band. I was like, hey, I want to pick up a CD. And like I met her on State Street and we talked. And then she was like, hey, we're playing King Club. Like I'm pretty sure like Tristan and Lisa will let you in. Like if you don't drink, like I didn't drink at the time. I The Hussy was pretty much a sober band at the beginning for mm -hmm. a long time. But you were underage, is that what... Oh, I was way underage. I was okay. 18 years old. And then she was like, but if you sell merch and don't drink, they'll let you in. Yeah. So I could go to all the King Club shows that they were playing and see the Screaming Sins in the Ponds and the Cummies and all these bands that I loved then. And I just sold their merch forever. And then <laughs> eventually, like six months in, their bass player quit. And they got a different guy. They had always had bass player problems. The, the list of people that have played bass in that band is like crazy. Like, it's really long. It's nine people. Yeah, eventually they were like, "Hey, we need a bass player. We know you played like I played. You played guitar since you were thirteen. You know, like mm -hmm. I'm. It was approaching. Yeah, I was eight. I was nineteen at the time. And then um, I said, "Yeah, sure." They bought me a bass. They bought me an amp, and we we did tours. We toured the U.S. We did Canada. Were you not in a band when this had happened? Well, my band was back from Plymouth, so I had moved here, and I didn't really have a band going. Okay, that's here. what I was wondering. I didn't yeah, know if you were yeah, currently so doing like, something like. I always, you know, knew I wanted to have a band and like I was involved with it and 
I don't know. Yeah, it just like worked out this way and like could play the songs easily and got along with Heather and and the other guy kind of just fizzled out and he quits and me and Heather are like, cool, that's fine. Like we'll make our own band. Mm -hmm. And then we made the Hussy. This whole time I've been recording bands like since I was 15 and I recorded Cats Not Dogs at the end. It never came out and stuff because all the stuff happened. But so I was kind of into recording, but when we were making the first thing, we were like, no, we need to like go to somebody that knows what they're doing because we had an idea. Maybe we were onto something and we knew a couple record labels. Like we, we actually sent it to a lot of record labels. Mm -hmm. Thought if we could get one seven inch out, that would be like the coolest thing that we ever did in our lives. And that would, that was our goal. When did you realize that it's like, I can kind of accomplish a lot of this on my own? It was hard at first, like the first couple years it seemed like we were treading water and stuff. But like I've said it this year to a lot of my friends, I said, I, I did everything I ever wanted to do in my life already. Mm -hmm. Like I, where me and Heather are from, Heather's from Marinette. We thought, you know, the best you could do in your life was you played at a VFW hall, maybe mm -hmm. for some kids. And then maybe when you got older, you were in a cover band. That's what I am from. Like yeah. I didn't even think it was possible to get a record. Out. I didn't think you could tour the U S I didn't think you could tour the world. Yeah. Like I, just didn't think we just didn't even think that was possible. Our goal was get a seven inch out, play some cool shows with our friends in Madison. And if we're lucky, holy cow, we could play Chicago, you know, and we did. And then the Chicago label eventually like put one of our records out. And then it became really easy to play Chicago. And then another Chicago label put out the second album. What labels? Uh, the first one was Slow Physic. That's defunct. Second one's Tic Tac Totally, mm -hmm. now defunct. Mm -hmm. At one time, Tic Tac Totally was actually a really big tastemaker in the underground. And it was like when we played Austin the first time the Hussy ever played Austin, we had, we had been a band for like three years. And we played it was sold out on a Monday night because this label had from Chicago has like such a respect in Austin. Like everybody knew who the band was. I was like, that was the first time I really was like, wow, like, okay, record labels do matter. And this is a tiny record label. This isn't even like a big record label, but like even in the underground, there's these little pockets where it's like, sometimes people look to certain places, but yeah. And then after that, then Southpaw picked us up. Were they finding you? Were you contacting them? How was that happening? I contacted, me and Heather contacted the first few record labels. Where were you finding them at? Uh, other bands that we love, like through the underground. First Chicago one came to me. Uh, Science of Sound did the first 7-inch, actually, and they agreed to do it the day before this Netherlands label came and wanted the same songs. And so then that's when we quick scrambled and recorded with Science of Sound mm -hmm. to make the second 7-inch because the first two 7-inches came out like concurrently because we sent them to over 60 record labels, mm -hmm. demos, like hard CD, sent it with a photocopy of like a Onion article about us, a little oh, Onion okay. clip. We were opening for this band that we loved called Cheap Time, and it only talked about us, and we just couldn't believe that. We were like, oh, wow. wow, we love this band. The little thing is about us, though. And so we sent it to a lot of labels that were involved with Cheap Time and the guy from Cheap Time. And so a lot of times they would read that and they'd be like, okay, well, they're playing with cheap time and they're not even talking about cheap time. Yeah. So like, I strongly believe that's probably how the first, the one in the Netherlands, cause that guy put out one of Jeff, the guy from cheap times, original bands. Yeah. So they just, and it was up their alley. I knew like the key to sending to record labels is not to send to every record label ever. It's like, you have to know what your band sounds like. You have to know what, the bands on the label sounds like, or you're never, they're not even going to listen to it if it doesn't even, if it's not in their wheelhouse, you know? So we were sending to garage labels just all the time. I mean, constantly. And then forever I was emailing, I don't know, you just make friends with the people. Eventually you trade them records. You, you send them like, Hey man, here's the records I've made. Like, what do you think? You know? And then they see that you're out touring and they're like, Oh yeah, I'll work with you. And I, I remember when, when I shopped weed seizure to Tic Tac totally uh, that's who we wanted to do it. So like we were like, we'll send it to Matt first. Mm -hmm. I sent it to In the Red first. Like that was always the first choice. And Larry liked it, but he wasn't, he didn't bite on it. But when that happened, we had literally had four record deals lined up that we were had seven inches coming up for four in a row. When I shopped and I told Matt that I was like, hey man, these labels are all confirmed to do a seven inch and I've got stuff set up for that. But here's the record we want to put up before all of that. Okay. And because back then me and Heather were like recording 25 songs a time. Were you recording them yourselves? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then 
from there on out, we recorded from the first LP after only the first three seven inches are not recorded. And we've made 12 seven inches and six LPs and all the LPs I did. But yeah, after uh, I sent it to Matt, I said, yeah, we would always have like 25 songs. We whittle it down to 15, 14 for the record. And then the rest would go to seven inches. And Matt just was like, I have to hear a band that has seven inches like lined up for all these labels. How are all these labels lined up to because we had a little thing going in the underground, you know, and like all those labels end up doing the records right in a row in the exact order. My way of thinking about it was, is if you had somebody putting out something of yours, they wouldn't want you to put something out on something else. How are you doing multiple things? Everything is a handshake deal. I've never signed anything. I own all the rights to everything. That's the smartest way to ever do it. That is uh, how Jack White did it. If you allow the record label to pay for the record, they own it. So I recorded it. So it's like, I own it. Like I had a, I never really had, I had a little bit of a problem with Tic Tac. They didn't want me to like transfer the rights of the record to somebody else. And I was like, well, dude, what you show me something where I signed that said, you own it. You don't own it, man. I wrote all the songs I recorded. So you're saying even the stuff that was put out on Tic Tac, you were releasing seven inches of songs from that? No, 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 nothing. Everything's always been different. Every single release has different stuff on it, but eventually Tic Tac, when it, When it starts to, I see that he's like kind of running his label into the ground. I'm like, hey man, I want to move this to a different record label. And Southpaw reissued our first LP already. So they were going to reissue the second LP then. They were going to reissue the Tic Tac, totally one. And he kind of wanted some money from that. And I was like, dude, no way. Like... I, where does it say that? Like, I didn't sign anything. Like, I own it. Were they selling them because you were touring or were they? It was already picked up by distributors. The Hussy was on, uh, like, Revolver Distribution, which they distribute, like, all the best garage stuff. So, like, that distributor, like, my record label is distributed by this this company. It's in California. It's in SF. Yeah, like, all these labels have are linked up with them. So that's how it gets to a store. Mm-hmm. So the record the records were in stores, you know, and... I don't, we were touring a lot. We played a hundred shows a year. There was a small window of time that we had a booking agent, but like it just didn't. I didn't like how they were doing it, so I just went back to doing it myself. How did this then turn into? You were in multiple bands, and then you started your own label. The label I started in 2010. I don't know. I just looked up to like Jay Retard, and that's what he was doing before he died. He was playing as many shows as he could, recording bands. He was putting them out. He was producing records, getting them put out on labels. And that's a lot of what I do now is help other bands get off the ground. I mean, originally, I never intended to be in more than one band. Heather was always in many bands at once Mm -hmm. because she's a great drummer and drummers are the hardest people to find. Uh, Fire Retarded was what they were called at the time. They sent me their demo. I knew them from like Alex Ross and Eric Love the Hussy. They had a different band that like, they loved the hussy and they like finally came and talked to me and I, I heard that they were making this new band and I was dating somebody that lived with one of them at the time. So I'd kind of be around all the time and yeah, they started this band and like their first show was going to, they were going to play out of town in, in a Kenosha with, with some friends just to like kind of get their feet wet. So I went with them really good band. And I was like, man, you got like, I, I want to be in this band. Like if you had another guitar player, like I, I'm not going to write anything. I don't want to write anything. But like, if I'm in the band, like I can get somebody to put this out easier if I'm in it, than just me kind of telling them they should put it out. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know. I just started playing in that and that was fun. And we never intended to do that much. And all of a sudden, like, yeah, stuff, we were playing a lot of shows and like, and then Cave Curse just kind of came out of like, being in between tours and recording demos at home of synth stuff and some label wanted to put it out. So I put it out and then I met the right guy who wanted to drum at one time. And then we played some shows around and then he moved away. And now then I was like, well, I have an LP coming out. I have to keep this band kind of going or I'm screwing over that record label. I found the people that I wanted and they all were into it. And if you were actively putting this stuff out through labels, then when did you finally decide like, okay, I'm going to create this kind Turkey label and why? I just wanted to help other bands. Like I never, I've only put out like one thing by the Hussy ever. Like I usually don't put out my own stuff. I'm mostly just trying to help somebody else maybe get something out, you know, like, and that's what I did back then. Now I changed the name. The name is No Coast now. I ran the label with a, a dude that I knew for a little while and then we had a falling out. And he didn't want anything to do with the label anymore. So like I 
you know, took it over. This was a long time ago now. So then eventually I was just like, you know, I'm just going to change the name. And I'd been thinking about it for a while. Like he was the one who came up with the name. I didn't really love the name. Mm. I liked No Coast. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to call it that. And maybe change the aesthetic of it a little bit. You were already doing a bunch. And then you said, well, I can do more than that. So why, <laughs> why did you add this on top of it? And what does that entail to like, okay, now you're doing this label helping out other people? I think it probably really started because originally... You know, I was throwing shows and then you can kind of put them all into this like box that it's like, hey, this is my thing. Mm -hmm. This is my promotion company. And I always made the flyers look the same way so people would know, yeah, that's that's like Bobby's show. To really promote bands that I was bringing through too. a lot of the I mean, most of the bands that I've ever released have been bands I have booked in town or that I am actively bringing. And like right now I've got I just got test presses back from a Montreal band that's never played here and they're coming to play my birthday party in April oh, cool. and I'm putting out their LP it's the first LP I've, I'm going to put out they're called Red Mass they've been a band like 10 years and they actually shot me the record they sent me the record and I've known the guy a long time he's had a lot of records put out on a lot of like similar labels as the Hussy and we kind of floated in the same circuit I was like, honestly, man, I don't think I can take on anything, you know, and then he sent it to me and it's so good that I was like, no, I'll, I'll do this. Like, okay. so I don't know. I just, I want to help bands. That's what I've always done. And I don't, I don't want to just help my band. My buddy, uh, Rick, he runs Rare Plant, which is like the most oh. prolific, like tape label in town. You know, when he was starting out, I was like, kind of like wanted to pass my thing off to him. I actually like stopped doing a lot of stuff. And I would, if a band would come to me, I'd be like, hey, actually, you should just do it on Rick's label. And I passed him a lot of bands. And he found a, most of the bands, of course, he found. But I think he's doing such a good job at, like, documenting what's happening in town here. He's putting out, like, so many local bands. He's the guy putting out all the local tapes. And I think he's doing that good, that well of a job that I kind of wanted to step aside and let him do that. So I've been focusing on out of town bands or maybe something that he wouldn't normally touch because we're homies. He's in fireheads. We're very good friends. When I met Heather, she was a little bit older than me and she taught me a lot about booking and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was thankful I had an older friend to do that. And I was like, Hey, I'm going to pass this on to Rick. Like, here's how you run a tape. I mean, I helped them run it, get it started but he's figured it all out and he does it his own way. He's got his own scheme to do it. Like I've got my own thing. Like he doesn't have distribution. He just distributes like around here. And I kind of like that. Yeah, No, I love it. Like, it's like, he's doing it his way. Yeah. And like, and he's put out like almost 40 tapes or something. I like that you're recording this stuff here in, in your house, but you're doing it analog. You're not doing it on the computer. I have a Tascam 388 that I use for most everything. And that, that'll usually have the band play live in the live room. I'd like to record a band entirely live and then do the guitar overdubs and the vocal overdubs. I generally don't like to try to ISO everything and do it all perfect because it, it just doesn't sound like a punk band. And I usually i am very picky about the bands that I'll even want to record. I usually approach a band and ask them if if they want to record. I, of course, have people ask me and sometimes I say yes, sometimes I say no. Um, I generally don't have enough time in my life to record every band that I want, and it's not about money for me. Basically, I have them, the drums mic'd up all to the tape machine, the guitar to the tape machine, bass to the tape machine, and then record that. I usually generally only let a band do like three takes of a song. Mm -hmm. Usually tell them they can't do more than that. And I'm not rude about it. I'm just like, hey man, like it's good enough because guess what? Like, you know how many times I've just let it be okay mm -hmm. and it slid right through. The average listener is never going to hear those little things and it doesn't matter and it actually probably makes it better, honestly, because it's not perfect. Like, do you, if you want to make a perfect record, I don't know why you're working with me is what is the deal. So, so then I dump it to a computer and then we do vocals through like a classic, like a SM7, like Michael Jackson Thriller vocal mic right. into... Uh, universal audio compressor it's classic you know chain what software are you using i just do it on GarageBand. that's all i've ever nice. had okay. yep so i dumped it to garage band and then i you know i'm using these good analog tools so it still sounds like oh. a it's just a means to arrange it yeah yeah and it's a means that you can make everything you know fade and pan and right. do all that crazy stuff that like you know of course i've mixed records on the tape machine and stuff it's just it's 2018, you'd kind of be an idiot to not at least use some 
of the tools of today. Like you yeah. can use some of the old tools to get a certain sound, but like if you're going to try to like stick so you're just going to get blown out of the water by the rest of the competition. You're right. just not even in the same competition anymore. I mean, every human has to evolve like that. I don't know. You should try to make things as good or as close to as good as you want them to be. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot from like the OCs. John Dwyer told me he's like, yeah, forever. He would only use the 388 and he refused to allow them to use a computer. And then one of the best recording engineers, Chris Woodhouse out in Sacramento, he was recording a lot of the records and letting him do that and being like, fine, we'll mix it on there or whatever. And then finally Woodhouse was like, you know what? I'm going to AB them. I'm going to record, play it off the tape play it off the digital i'm gonna make dwyer not know which one is which and i'm gonna ask him man can you actually tell and he never could tell so it's like and he's just like that was like mind-blowing to him he's like then i switched to like using the tape machine and then dumping it to a computer yeah because Let's no go with normal, what's easier no normal person is sitting listening with twenty thousand dollar speakers that they can hear like oh my gosh that's a little like if you are, why, you, again, why are you listening to our bands? Like, you know, you should be listening to a Steely Dan record or a Fleetwood Mac record that was, they spent a million dollars making, you know, like that's what that's for. But yeah, so that's generally why I dump it to a computer. I mean, of course there's analog purists and whatever. Generally, me and Heather write our own songs outside of the band. We okay. bring them in. For the last couple of years, if I write a song, I'll usually record it to a click like a demo, like a quick acoustic or like an electric guitar direct in and then do a vocal take. And then I'll send that to Heather because then she can have some time at home to think about it. Because, I mean, generally when Heather records her song, she shows me it. I mean, the way the hussies worked in the past, like we'll know which songs are going to be played live. We'll know which ones we're only going to record. Okay. We'll have demoed them, like practice them two times or something. Then we'll go in the studio and hit record usually record right away and just keep yeah. it the way it is. And like some, so I don't know, so many songs that we've made have never been played live. Like we just recorded them in the studio because it's like, we're making a record. Yeah. We, I got these 20, I got 12 songs. You got 12 songs. Cool. Let's record them all. And you know, which ones are better, you know, you know, you know, but why not record them all? Like we've always, that's what Jay always did. Jay retired, always recorded and put everything he ever did out there is no unreleased hussy recordings they are all out on something yeah it's like when we make something it gets sent to our record label and somebody takes it and then the, it's put out when we're trying to scrape the barrel someday there's not going to be much of a barrel to scrape i've been lucky and most things i've ever done in my life have had support you know but you still you know i don't know it's like it's hard to get record labels in general we've had unbelievable good luck you know i i but like we've also been crushed by a lot of bigger labels that we love that we thought might work with, you know, and that that's a real part of the music industry is like being told no, you know, like and we've been extremely fortunate. So I don't want to come across the wrong way. But, uh, you know, there's always been record labels that I've looked up to that I've wanted to work with that pass on it. Yeah. So like and I live with that, you know, all the time. Like I send I still send you know, demos and stuff to big labels that I love that hoping someday, you know, maybe they'll do something. And mm -hmm. yeah, like Larry from In the Red, he's told me a story once. He's like, yeah, you know, I turned down the White Stripes. That sounds ludicrous now. Like a, a, a good label turned down like this band that's so obviously good, you know, but it's like it's it's not that easy to see when it's happening, mm -hmm. you know, for them, for the label, you know, they, you know, I don't know. So you always hope maybe someday somebody thinks that about you. That's why we've made so much stuff. That's why we kept putting stuff out. That's why we keep playing shows. That's why we keep working because it is it is a slow build. I strongly like I work at a record store. I've seen the the you know the phase of a hot band that like really didn't do any work. Yeah. They come up, they get really hot, and then nobody cares about them four right. years later because they never even put in. They have no real fans. They had fans who jumped on at the time when it was cool to jump on. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think me and Heather have done the thing where it's like, okay, we cemented our thing that we did. And like, it's not just a fluke. It's not just, we didn't just come about, got popular, cool, walked away. It's been a slow burn the whole time and everything is a slow climb. Like, you know, I mean, that's, that is what it is. Every, every contact you make is a contact again in the future and, I tried to always make shows events. I didn't try to just make it a show. 
if the hussy was playing it had a it's not just to play like i see so many local bands just playing a show to just play and it's like well what? no like play a show for a touring band or play a show for like a cause there's no need to just like if you just want to play just play at your house like yeah. you know and a lot of people don't want to do the work of going to see the other bands want to do the work of getting to know the other bands but i'm out there i see all the bands like I work two jobs. I play in three bands. I'm still at all the shows. I'm still, mm -hmm. you know, trying to see a new band because that stuff still excites me. And I think a lot of people are not in it for the same reason as me, maybe, you know, like mm -hmm. I've said this a lot in the last year. Like, I think there's two types of people who make bands, people who make bands to play music with their friends and have fun. And that's like their creative outlet. And then there's people who have a message. And I strongly am the person who doesn't have a message my message is like hey man isn't it fun just to play music and like isn't it fun just to see a cool band that you like like they don't need to sell you anything they don't need to sell you a political view like so is it like a problem that i just want to like go in a room with four dudes and just jam and right now i'm finishing up recording wash which i think is a very good band in town probably the best band going right now that's new and they've played maybe 10 shows eight shows the record's really good and then I just finished Wood Chicken's new record uh, and Dumb Vision, and those are both like out now. They're finally like on vinyl out. Where do you print your vinyl at? The one I have coming, I had Rainbow do it, but usually the chain would be I mix it, it gets mastered by Justin Perkins, and then it used to always go to Lucky Lacquers, which is a great place, and then he would send it to Rainbow. It just depends on the record label that we're working with. The rec like The record label that we work with out on the East Coast, Big Neck, who like I got like to do the Wood Chickens record, and they do Fireheads, Hussy, Wood Chickens, and Dumb Vision. Okay. I've got all those deals worked out. Is there a minimum for what they pressed, or oh uh, yeah, yeah, they're pressing like five hundred probably of everything. Like they go through Morpheus, this pressing plan out there okay. because it's it's right near them, and that's that label's existed for twenty years, so they have always worked with this one pressing plant. But yeah, they go there. It really just depends on the label. Some labels, you know, have relationships with other pressing plants. And when we were on Southpaw, he switched it up almost every time. Back then, it was took a long time to get records. Like, uh, now there's a few more plants, so the, the, the weight has been lifted off some of the other plants. But back then, he would kind of call around and see which one could do it quicker. And you probably have to pay more, you know. But, like, a lot of times we needed it because back then we were working so much. We were touring all the time that it was like, yeah, we need this record out. Like we have a tour booked, like we need it for that. Then it's really important for the label to like, you know, spend an extra $500 to get it because <laughs> otherwise you're not, you're missing out on selling those hundred copies right there on that tour. You know, I always try to do over 400 because at that point it's a better price break mm -hmm. per copy. Sure. Yes. It sucks because maybe you're going to sit on them, but if like, I generally only will put out a band that I know can get rid of 400. I just, like you have to be a business person and be financially smart and know that a band is going to tour. And that is the hugest part. Like if a band's not going to tour, they're going to sell a hundred records. Okay. It's, I mean, unless you're extremely lucky, but if you're from Madison, Wisconsin, you're not from Chicago, you're from, not from New York, you're not from LA. Right. There's probably not a spotlight on you. Mm -hmm. So you probably have to get out and at least play, you know, 30 shows out of town to get rid of some records. Like, yeah. and that's the way you get another label to work with you. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is just hand in hand with it. It's like a record label's not chomping at the bit to put out some band that's only interested in playing 12 shows a year in their hometown. You can check out more of The Hussy at thehussy.bandcamp.com. Or you can just search the internet for The Hussy like you should. If you haven't already, you can subscribe to this show at lorenzosmusic.com, where you can also download all of our music for free. I'll be back next week, so until then, I'll talk to you later. Later.